Um, let, me, let me ask you uh, uh, this question. How many um, you have, and no, there's no condemnation here at all, okay? But how many have bumper stickers on your car? Because you love, there's no bumper sticker you don't like. I mean, maybe it's, I know, see, I know you do, and you're not going to raise your hand, are you? So there are those of you, um, because they they represent where you travel, right? It's okay. Um, Or, okay, yes, you got bumper stickers there, because they represent where you travel. Okay, thank you, thank you you very much. Um, Some of you have um, bumper stickers that um, identify you um, with maybe um, a certain political party, maybe, maybe not, maybe not, you know, I don't know, um, or certain part of your life, you know, you found a sticker that says blah, 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 and you stuck it on your, okay, no, we got that, so bumper stickers or whatever, whatever, what, how many hate them? Okay, more, more, so we voted out all of you who like them, okay, so I, I'm kind of, I'm there too, I'm not a real bumper sticker, I do have a little sticker on my truck, but it's just my, it's, you know, it just says Tundra, Tundra, and for a real, real truck owners, okay? So anyway, um, but other than that, but, they, but what these things do is they, ident- they identify you, they align you with whatever the bumper sticker says. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it's where you travel, sometimes it's, you know, who you are or, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, there, there, I'm going to have you guess it in just a moment, but there, there is a symbol or a sticker, if you will, that you see on a lot of cars or doorways or maybe even tattooed, you know, you see that maybe even um, uh, on Christians. So what do you think that symbol or that sticker is? Anybody want to guess? Huh? Fish? A cro- oh, a cross. Okay, well, yes, a cross would be true. Okay, but also maybe, maybe this right here, right? Yes, right? A fish. Yeah. And so you see that a lot. It identifies, it aligns a person as, as a follower of Jesus. And this actually goes way back in history. Christians um, have done it from the early days of Christianity. In fact, even in, in the catacombs of, of, of Rome, they're filled with fish symbols of Christians who were persecuted and, 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 were, and were buried there. Um, we know that the fish symbol became symbolic of people who identify or follow Jesus. In fact, I was reading one time where what would happen is there'd be a traveler along the way, and you meet up with another traveler, maybe someone you didn't know, and you would, you would take and you would draw like half the fish, so just this line in the sand, and if the other person completed it, so it looked like this, and you knew it was safe, and you knew that they were also a follower of Jesus. It was a way to identify yourself as a follower of Jesus. So it really comes from an acronym, a Greek acronym, that, that means Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. It was a way of declaring one's allegiance to Jesus Christ. Now, this is true, and I, you know it's true, and I probably don't even have to say it, but simply placing a fish on your car doesn't make you a follower of Jesus, yes? I mean, that's, you can go, duh, it's okay. Um, or putting it on your door, it, it doesn't make you a follower of Jesus, it just identifies you as a follower of Jesus, and that's really important to kind of remember this morning as we kind of dive into what we're talking about today. It declares who you are. So hang on to that for a second. If you're new with us, and we've been in this series, we're in part seven today, uh, living out your Jesus DNA. So we're calling it DNA. And it's not living out who you are or the characteristics that you were born with, that you were handed down um, from maybe your, your parents, your mom, or your dad. Um, and I'm sure this, you know, I, my, my hair is white because my mother had white hair. And they say you get that from your mother and my kids, they don't stand a chance, you know, but that's just the way it is. So I inherit that characteristic and that, and that trait. I, I inherited um, this trait from my mother that like you do it now, you don't wait until tomorrow, that type of thing. And so you carry those kind of traits too, don't you? you, like that you were handed down with. Well, when we became a follower of Jesus, we became a brand new person, and we now live out our Jesus DNA. And so we've been exploring 
What that looks like as followers of Jesus. Now, there, there's probably a whole lot more than what we've talked about. And we'll be concluding in a couple weeks as we head up um, to, to Easter. But we, we've talked about being people of the Word. So part of our Jesus DNA is, is living out people of the Word or the truth of the Word. We stand on the biblical truth of the Bible. Amen. And that's where truth is found, and it doesn't change. <clears throat> we talked about being people of community. That is, the Bible calls us together to do what we're doing this morning, and I'm preaching to the choir because you're here, and thank you for that, online perhaps, but we are people who are to gather together. And I think Sarah taught so well yesterday, or yesterday, last week, and if you missed it, you should go back online, you should check it out, because one of the things that she talked about is the visible testimony of people coming together like you and I are doing in unity, celebrating one God, one Lord and Savior. So we come from different um, environments, from different journeys. We, are, we think different about a lot of different things, but we come together um, with this one thing. Jesus is Lord and Jesus is Savior and he is the one that we worship and he is the only one. And when we do that in community, it's a visible testimony to those people out there. How many cars have driven by Gateway today and going like, what's going on there? And that there might be a whole bunch of responses, but what's going on there is those people are worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ together. So we are people of community. We are people of commitment. So Mario and I talked, <clears throat> talked about that. And we really encourage people to step into, into membership. And a good group last week, this is like, we want to explore membership. And uh, we talked about the importance of taking that extra step, especially today. And as members, you help provide the guardrails from um, this faith community. Uh, and I, I think I can promise you that we, that we won't ship, but you provide the guardrails that protect us from doctrinal shift, as we've seen in some other, other cases. So the importance of saying, like, I belong and I commit. So people of, of commitment. Then we talked about people of praise. So um, that's when we talked about God's generosity, remember? God was so generous, loved you so much, loved me so much that he did what? Gave his son Jesus, right? We talk about the son given uh, as a sacrifice for the whole world, right? He died for the whole world. But I encourage you that week to, sit, to put your name in there. Put your name in there. So God sent his son Jesus for Tom. God sent his um, son Jesus for your name, for each and every one of us. He died for the whole world, but he did so one person at a time. He was generous towards you and me. That leads to people of practice. Our response to a generous God, and it takes so many different forms. We talked about financial giving. We talked about serving. We talked about living out this life generously because he has been so generous to us. And then last week, as I mentioned, Sarah talked about people of unity. We come together. Well, there are so many things that we can allow to divide us, right? There are so many th ways that the enemy tries to get in and goes like, hey, you know, you got this, you, you, you got that. You, um, on and on it, it, it goes. But but we are people who are unified through this one message that Jesus has come to save lost people and grant them an eternity with him, to reconcile us to, to the Father. Well, today we're talking about people of identity. Now, right away, let me tell you what I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about um, your job title. <clears throat> not talking about how many letters you have after your name. Not talking about what I identifies you um, um, to other people around you or how you sign your name. I'm talking about one of the identifiers of a follower of Jesus that I fully believe in. I want to challenge many of you. We're going to celebrate today, and I'm going to challenge some today take a, to take a brand new step in identifying who you are. I'm not going to give you a fish to stick on your car. That, that's, that's not what we're talking about. I'm not going to give you a bumper sticker, but it does involve one act of obedience on your part as a follower of Jesus um, if you have not. We're talking about water baptism today as one way that we express what Jesus has done in our brand new life with him is part of our gospel story. And so we talk about water baptism. Now, I understand that many here have already been water baptized. I, I, I get that. Many, many have not. And, and so 
That's why we celebrate, and I want to encourage many of you to perhaps on Easter to take that brand new step to, to water baptism. Now, I know exactly what you're thinking. Like, mean I have to get into that tank right over there? The answer is, yeah, that's where we baptize people, right there. Um, yeah, water's usually warm, but not always, but mostly it, it is. And so that's what we're talking about. But why? Why do we do that? That's the important part that I want to share with you today. People identify as followers of Christ through water baptism as part of our gospel story. And it's also commanded in Scripture, and we'll see that in just a moment. But let me give you a definition of water baptism. It's kind of lengthy, but here it is. A symbolic act that identifies a believer or a Christian with the Lord Jesus Christ and his message. It is a public testimony or an outward confession of the experience that has occurred inwardly in a believer's life. Now, that's kind of a long definition. I'd like for you to repeat it, okay? I just cover it up. Now, you go ahead and repeat it, right? So, I, it's, it's kind of long. So, here's what I've done. I've broken it down into four or five words. So, that's really, really easy to remember. Are you ready? Okay, I, I think this will be helpful. Here it is. Number one, um, what is water baptism? It's symbolizing inner faith outwardly. That's pretty good, isn't it? I can tell you were impressed. Okay, let's try number two. Number two, here we go. Um, outward sign of inward change. Okay, third one right here. How about public display of Christian identity? Okay, you like that one better. Okay, all right, so there you go. So, and five words, because that, that's what it is. It's, an, it's, a dis, it's a symbolic act that says, I align my allegiance is with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's commanded in Scripture, in fact, in Matthew 28, which we refer to as a great commission because that's what it is, what Jesus did. In Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20, here we go. Now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Doing what? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. It's interesting, isn't it, I think, that Jesus says, go, make disciples, baptize them, incorporate them within the family of God, and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Those who believe, those who um, align with Christ, people of faith, disciples, were to be baptized in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And such an act, this act of water baptism, would associate the believer with the person of Jesus Christ and the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To God whom they serve is one God, yet existent in three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And at Gateway, we believe that water baptism is an important part of being a Jesus follower. It's part of our story to those around us that we have given our life to Christ, and our intention is to follow him in obedience all of our life. What we're saying is we identify with his death, we identify with his, re with his resurrection, and we will walk with him in a brand new life. We are, are people of identity as we follow Jesus. People worldwide at risk of life, literally, are being baptized in water. When you, when you enter this tank, you're not risking your life. We have never lost anybody yet. Not one time. You are not risking your life. It's not that, but people around the world are. I was in a, in a, in a foreign country um, on behalf of, of, of Gateway and was told, and we know, we know that this is true, that you can, you can claim to be a follower of Jesus, but um, as soon as you are baptized, now you've identified as a follower of Jesus, and now your life is at risk. It's that important. It's so much part of, of life. You, you take on a brand new identity as a person of, of faith. 
Now, I, I want to um, make this. You are not being baptized into a church. Are you with me? Because many of you are, you come from different backgrounds, different areas, and different, you were baptized into the family of God. We're not talking about being baptized in, in the gateway. We're talking about being baptized as a symbolic act. I am part of the body of Christ. I identify as a follower of Jesus. So years ago, so I, I, I um, shared a little bit of my story in the past, but I was, I was very young when I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I still remember it. It's, just in, it's emblazoned in, in my mind. I was nine years old, and I was at a camp that would be similar to where there, our students are, are today, but I was nine. And I can, I can still remember kneeling at an altar and confessing Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I can remember the exact words I said. And I followed that up when I think I was 10 years old, just a year later or so, with water, water baptism. And um, in the audience, of course, were um, my family and, and the church. But something, something was happening, and I wasn't quite sure how to handle it. Here's the story. Um, I have four other siblings, and all of my siblings have last names that begin, or excuse me, middle names that begin with the letter A like Arthur and Arvin and whatever else. Anyway, um, and, and then there's me. And, and I don't have a middle name. I just have an initial. It's just A. So for some reason, um, my mom could never actually adequately answer the question when I'd ask her, you know, why did you not give me a middle name? Because it's like my older sister and my older brother. Um, so, you know, like Arvin and Tom A., and then my two other brothers, right, Alan and middle name and Arthur. So they all got them except for me. And, and so it's just Thomas A. So when I sign official documents, I often have to put M-I-O, which means middle initial only, because like, who would believe you, I guess. But um, so I was in this baptism line, and all my friends, they were giving their full, the pastor was asking them their name. And they would give their full name, including their middle name. And I'm thinking, I'm 10 years old, and I don't have a middle name. And I'm going to be baptized. And uh, so I took on a middle name. And my mother had knew nothing about it. Sitting in the audience was my mom. And sitting also in the audience was one of my uncles, who, who really became a father figure to me, Lloyd Valnez, who was a Pearl Harbor survivor, passed away a um, um, few years back. But his, his, his actual name, his full name was Albin, A-L-B-I-N, Albin. Lloyd Valnez. I thought, starts with an A. Thomas A. So I took on the identity Thomas Albin Dushman. My mother knew nothing about it. My uncle knew nothing about it. And when the pastor asked me, what's your name? I proudly said, it's Thomas Albin Dushman, which he then announced to the entire congregation. And my mom and my uncle were, were there. And it was, it was wonderful, I'll tell you. And, and yeah, I got a lot of you know, a lot of good out of that one because, like, uncle was very, very proud. So anyway, but here's what happened. I t in that moment, right, I took on a new identity. And when you're being baptized, you're not, you're, you're, you're not taking on a new identity because you did as a follower of Jesus. What you are simply saying is, like, this is who I identify with. This is my identity. I'm a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, water baptism is very, very scriptural. There's a story in the Bible in Acts chapter 8. Now, Acts is the historical book of the Bible, right? And so here's what we read in Acts chapter 8, verse 26 through 40. And it's, and it's, it's interaction between um, Philip and the eunuch, Ethiopian eunuch. And here's what's taking place. The angel of the Lord, so God, sent Philip. And he says this, Arise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And so he went. Well, the reason that God sent him there was because in this chariot, if, if you will, um, was this Ethiopian eunuch who was reading the scripture. And here's how it goes. He was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah, the, the eunuch was. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join the chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? Thinking that's obviously why God sent him. And the eunuch says, how can I understand? How, how can I? Unless someone guides me. And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. So come on up into the chariot and let's, let's have a conversation. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, eunuch. Like 
Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And so the unity goes like, what's that about? About whom, I ask you, does a prophet say this about himself or, or someone else? And then Philip began to open his mouth, and he began to tell him the story of Jesus. So the Bible says, beginning with Scripture, he told them, Philip did, told him the good news about Jesus. Now, we can assume, because the next part, um, the eunuch says, I want to be baptized. We can assume then that the eunuch received Christ, right? And so they're traveling along, and, and, and the eunuch spotted some water and goes, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And, of course, the answer is nothing. So Philip baptized him. They commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down, and Philip baptized the eunuch. And then something really interesting happens, and I don't know, and I can't explain to you why it happened, but when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more. That's a pretty cool part of Scripture, don't you think? Now, that has never happened over here. Like, so far, everybody has stayed. So, so far, like, it's never go, okay, boom, you're gone, you know. But that's what happened here, right? Philip disappeared. The eunuch um, was on his own. And Philip found himself in this place called called Azotus. And uh, then he went around preaching the gospel. It's biblical. It's biblically based. So, the question is then, who should be baptized? That's, that's the, the, the right question to ask. And the answer is, every person who has received Jesus Christ into their heart as his personal Savior, or believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we call it believer's baptism. And what that means is that um, if you're baptized and you're not a follower of Jesus, it doesn't do anything because baptism doesn't save you. Yes? Baptism doesn't save you. If you're baptized as a non-believer, you come out wet as a non-believer. Or, or let's say it this way, you just come out a soggy sinner. That's what you do right there. Nothing changes you, right? Because baptism is a declaration of what has already taken place. This is why when we dedicate Oh, this is why we dedicate children rather than baptize them because we believe that baptism follows a confession of faith. Now, what is it? Here, I just want to give you a few things as we head towards home here. Number one, it's your story that you personally believe in and belong to Jesus Christ. It's part of your gospel story that through repentance, you, you have received him into your heart as Lord and Savior, and this is what I'll just call a visual uh, sermon illustration of what's taking place in your life. So when I get the opportunity to, to do chapel for our schools and so on, especially with the younger kids, I always try to figure out what's an illustration that can really like enforce the teaching, right? And so I usually go to our, our children's pastor, Shelly, and go, look, here's the deal. I got this thing coming up. I got to have an illustration. Help a brother out, okay? So anyway, um, and she does, because il- it's a, illustrations help, help tell the story. And so that's what water baptism is. It's telling the story. Now, there's lots of us going, well, um, I'm a follower of Jesus, and, and that's my story. And I'm on my way to heaven, and you are. You are. But I'm embarrassed because that happened a long time ago, and I haven't followed the Lord in water baptism. I want to do everything I can to kind of remove those things from your life, right? Um, or you're afraid of water. Look, I'm a non-swimmer. I get it, okay? Um, but like I said, we haven't lost anybody. But I have my Cindy McBride to come up here. I was going my friend, but she's more than that. Um, and uh, uh, Cindy's daughter and my son are married. Yeah, that's pretty cool right there. And so we share the same grandkids, right? And, and I remember, um, and Cindy has been on our team uh, years ago. When I, when I first came, Cindy was serving as our daycare director. He has served in numbers of areas and so on. But um, I remember your husband, Ron, who has now passed away. He's with Jesus, right? Which makes heaven a little bit sweeter, doesn't it? For him. For him, yes. And your hope. 
Yeah, exactly. And Ron just passed away uh, just a about a year and a half ago. So I know that's close. But Ron, Ron was one of those guys as an adult that stepped forward. Would you tell that story? Ron was in baptismal with Pastor Mark. It was 1988. And Mark looked around in the congregation and he said, how many of you know Ron? And most of the people in here, we'd been part of the church for eight years. Ron had run the greeting program. He did all the games at the park and and all these kind of things. And um, so they said, and then he turned to Ron. He goes, Ron, how long have you known Jesus? And Ron said, six weeks. The place was silent. They couldn't believe it. And afterwards, Ron was out in the lobby, and he had several men come up to him and say, wow, that was really brave. Ron's going, no, I was just being obedient. Yeah, that's it right there. I just want to put a plug in for the Basque. You don't have to be a family. I did it for a month last year. Okay, you're going off script now. Okay, all right, okay. And, and I remember that story so well. In fact, I, I wove it into Ron's um, memorial service that we celebrate. Here is a guy who says, look, I'm, I'm going to be a follower of Jesus. I don't care uh, what people thought. And so maybe that's part of your gospel, gospel story. Number, number two, it's a, it's a way of confirming. Um, it's God's way of confirming what has happened to you. You've been born again. It's his way of, of confirming what's happened to you. Um, in our day, we understand the language of initiation. It's an initiation of sorts into a, into a new life because it symbolizes our spiritual union with Christ. And so the command is, go out and make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's a declaration of your intention and desire to live a new way of life by God's power. It's not you saying, I will never make another mistake again. Because we all make mistakes, yes? So I was baptized at 10 years old. Do you think I've lived the perfect life? (laughs) Well, yes, amen, because you need to say that louder next time, okay? No, of course not. We all make mistakes, right? Right. Here's why I say that, because the enemy will use that against you to go like, wait, you did that, and you were baptized, and look look at, you just screwed it up, you know, like that. No. We all make mistakes. It's our declaration of our intention and desire to live a new life by God's power, his spirit that lives in us. So Romans chapter six, verses eight through 14. Now we have died with Christ. We believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. We identify with that. For the death he died, he died to sin. Once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin, that's what we do, and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of righteousness, for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law, but under grace. So it's our intention, our declaration to live for him the rest of our life. Baptism points beyond our present to God's eternal community. So identifies with the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and the hope, it symbolizes our hope of participation, participating in that fellowship that is to come. We're going to be with him forever. It's your identification, number four, with the body of Christ. And as I said before, you're not baptized into gateway. We don't do that. You are baptized identifying with the body of Christ. So who's the head of the church? Yeah, Christ, Jesus. Everybody say that. Who is the head of the church? It's Christ, Jesus. It's not Tom's church. So I've corrected, I don't know how many people when they go like, we come to your church. No, you don't. I'm just like the rest of us. I worship here together. This is God's church. It's Christ's church. We belong to him. He is the head of the body. And when we are baptized, we, we recognize and we symbolize that we are part of the body of Christ. We belong to one another. The old is gone and the new has come. It initiates us into a new community. So quickly, what does water baptism not do? Well, we've already talked about, but it doesn't remove your sins. It doesn't do that. Only confession does that. First John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And so in a few minutes, we're going to pray. And, and I'm going to lead us in a, in a prayer of confession and a prayer of celebration for many of us. But it's only confessing our sins to Christ that removes our sins. Water baptism doesn't do that. It's a symbolic act. Something has happened inside. It doesn't make us a new person. It shows that we are already a new creation. It doesn't mean we'll, we'll never make a mistake, and we just talked about that, but we give ourselves to God, um, trusting him to lead us every day by the power of the Holy Spirit. Baptism becomes a significant marker in our lives that we return to when we are discouraged. There are times in our life, and I know this happens to all of us, it happens to me, and I know it happens to you, that the enemy will come along and, you know, like he starts pointing his fingers at you and going like, who are you, who are you, and you screwed up, and you screwed up, and what kind of Christian are you, and all that. And, and uh, I like what Martin Luther, um, what he shared one time, and here's what he did. Reflecting back on bab- baptism, whenever Satan would continually strike at Martin Luther with doubts, the great reformer would grab the devil by the collar, take him back through time, and throw him down in front of the baptismal waters, and then he would say this right here. He said, you see, Satan, Martin Luther is baptized. And here, yeah, that's right. And so here's what he was saying. You see, I, I belong to Christ. And that's what we're saying with water baptism. And that's why we're going to pray and we're going to celebrate because many of you have followed the Lord in water baptism. Some of you have not. And on Easter, we're going to celebrate water baptisms. And I know some of you, maybe your, your heart's starting to go like, okay, now, what am I going to do? Am I going to do it? Am I going to take that step? I hope so. I hope so. Um, I'm going to put a number up on the screen for you. I'm going to leave it up there for just a few moments. It's our text-in number, um, uh, 360-505-4636, coming up there. Um, and, and you can text in more. And I think it's option number three. If you just put the number three in, you'll get a form back. And you're saying, oh, I want to be baptized in, in water. And we're on Easter, I pray that we have many, many, many that follow the Lord. Now, I want to set you at ease. Um, do you have to say something? No, you don't. Some people do, but you don't have to. So some people just don't like to talk in front of people, right? And that's okay. Um, you, don't, you don't have to do that. Will we lose you? No, I already said that. We've never lost any, any, anybody yet. Um, um, is the water cold? Sometimes, but who cares, right? Um, sometimes it's warm. Um, um, yeah, I don't know. What else could I say, right? Um, do I need to be embarrassed if, it, if I am a follower of Jesus for many, many? No, no, you don't need to be embarrassed. We just want to celebrate, celebrate with you. And if you'll text into that number, I just believe it's going to be a great day of celebrating the res- resurrection of our Lord and people who are identifying with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all I have for you today. That's it right there. And we're going to pray. And and I'm going to pray um, two prayers. One is for those of you who may be here in person or maybe online, if you never received Christ as your Lord and Savior. So I referenced 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. And he cleanses from all unrighteousness. I'll say what I say so many times here if if you've been hanging around for a while. There's no magic words you have to line up in perfect order, right? It's just you saying, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me. And and I'm going to trust you with my life. If you do that with an open heart, you become that brand new person in the Lord Jesus Christ. You are now a follower of Jesus. That's what happens. And you have a brand new hope and a brand new eternity. I'm going to pray for those of us who have followed the Lord in water baptism. And we'll just pray a prayer of celebration. Then I'll pray for those of you who may be sitting there right now going, he's talking to me, he's talking to me. I don't know if I want to do it or not. That maybe you would step forward and do that and let us celebrate with you. Amen. Let's stand together, shall we? Oh, Father, I thank you today for the opportunity we have to worship together, to be together in this place. Um, There are people around the world that do not have what we have today. So I would pray that we would never forget or never take it for granted. And perhaps you are here today in person or online. You've never received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You never made him Lord of your life. I just want to pray with you um, that that as as you look to him, 
as you confess your need for him and your sin for him, you will, you will come to that place where you receive him as your Lord and your Savior and your trust in him. And you will declare yourself as a follower of Jesus, not because of what you have done, because it's not by works, it's by faith, but by your faith and trust in him. And it's just a simple prayer. It goes, Lord, I ask you to forgive me. I confess my sin for, to you. I confess my need for you. And I receive you as my Lord and Savior. If you prayed that prayer just now, you now identify as a follower of Jesus. There are many here today who celebrated that through water baptism. And God, we just come back to that place right now. For some of us, it was many years ago, maybe for others, just a few years ago. But in this life, Lord, that sometimes the enemy tries to discourage, we, we go, we're going back to that place right now, and we're celebrating what, you've done in our, what you have done in our life and the brand new hope that we have. And for those, Lord, who might be considering um, the opportunity and the privilege and the command of water baptism, God, would you just... Would you just encourage them, Lord, to take that step so that we can celebrate as a body together? I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.